And welcome into Pressbox Live. I'm Stan the Fan Charles of Pressbox and PressboxOnline.com. With me as usual is the old left-hander, Ross Grimsley, who keeps looking younger than anybody else. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, I got the magic juice. I bet you do. <laughs> hey, joining us tonight is one of our favorite people. He played for the Orioles. He broadcast for the Orioles. He played for the Oakland A's. He played for the New York Mets. And now his big job, he's an instructor with the Baseball Warehouse, and we're going to talk about that. Our guest is Mike Bordick. Mike, how are you? Hey, I'm good, Stan. How you doing? Good to see you, Ross. And hey, that's yeah. the old school red juice you're drinking, isn't it? You, and, you know, I wasn't going to say nothing. <laughs> you brought that up. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, before we before we get started, Mike, I know you, you came into Baltimore rather late compared to Ross and I, um, so I'm going to start with Ross. Do you have a brief remembrance of Tom Matty, Ross? Well, I mean, obviously, when I was growing up, living in Memphis, Tennessee, I was a Baltimore Colt fan. I, and uh, Unitas and uh, uh, Tom Matty, Lenny Moore, Raymond Berry, some of the other guys. And uh, I, I was very fortunate uh, when I got here in Baltimore, I lived around a lot of those guys. My son played hockey with Johnny Unitas' son. Uh, Tom Matty was a hockey coach at the time. That's where I met him. And obviously saw him around town, a lot of the different uh, events and uh, golf outings and what have you. And it was a thrill for me just to be around uh, those guys. Ordell Bracey lived in the same neighborhood uh, that I did. So, yeah, it was very special and uh, very exciting for me to have the pleasure of meeting and being friends with those guys. Hey, Thursday night, uh, our normal Wednesday night Zoom, we're going to have Gary Stein and I are going to be joined with by Scott Garceau and Bruce Cunningham both broadcast partners with Tom for a long time. Uh, Mike, I know you didn't know him as long as we did, but uh, I'm sure you got a couple of fond memories of him. Yeah, absolutely. Well, obviously his smile could light up a room, but, you know, I think I've been so fortunate coming to Baltimore and being able to meet so many incredible Baltimore legends, and he fit right in with all the greats. You know, uh, every time I met him at a sporting event, it you know, I'd always uh, talk to him. He most generally come over to me, say, hey, you know, like I'd known him forever. Uh, kind of in that same regard, like Brooks Robinson would do, you know, or Boone Powell, just uh, made you feel comfortable, made you feel like you'd known him forever. And uh, just the salt of the earth guy that I know, I always saw him with a smile on his face. He was yeah. always happy and loved to be involved in, in all the uh, Baltimore events. Ross, anybody like a libation more than Tom Maddy? <laughs> Artie <Okay>. Donovan, probably. <laughs> but no, he, he lived life to the fullest. Uh, yeah. Had a good time and did a lot of great things. And like uh, Mike said, he's, he was fun to be around. Always had a smile on his face. Always, Always treated. He treated everyone. Never saw him, uh, you know, frown or, or, or give anybody a hard time. He was always really friendly with, with the fans and with the uh, peers, you know, which was really special. Well, I understand that the uh, there's going to be a, a viewing, uh, even though Tom has been cremated, there's going to be sort of the equivalent to a viewing at Ruck's funeral home on Thursday, the 18th of November, between two and four and six and eight. And I think the funeral will be the next day. Uh, and I'll get the details out on Thursday night again. Gary Stein and I, Thursday at seven, will be joined by Scott Garceau and Bruce Cunningham, two of his uh, longtime broadcast partners. Let's talk a little baseball. Mike, we're going to get in. I want to really do a good chunk of this and talk a little bit about the baseball warehouse. But I do want to start with the World Series. And when I, I'm not saying I'm right every year. I thought Houston was sort of the better team because of their dominant offense. But there was something in the, in the preceding couple series – I thought I saw that Atlanta really seemed to know how to pitch to the Milwaukee hitters and the Dodger hitters. And I ended up picking them based on that and the thought that they had a little bit better pitching. That was before I knew Charlie Morton was going to get hurt in the first inning or second yeah, inning. Right. Um, your thoughts on scouting, the importance of advanced scouting when you're getting ready for the playoffs. Yeah, well, it's super important. You know, advanced scouting, I, I think, has played a role in, in just every regular season game as well. Yeah. I mean, you want to win every series, so you get your advanced scout in there. You go over the hot hitters. 
uh, typically go over how to defend guys. Um, and, and you talk, you hear the pitchers talk about how they're going to pitch certain hitters, right? Well, that Astros lineup was as strong as I've ever seen. And, and that Braves uh, pitching staff really, really dominated, shut them down. I mean, they had that one breakout game and it kind of made you go, oh my gosh, now they're going to come back. But it all comes down to the execution. And yeah, they had a great game plan. I think it really kept this uh, that Astros offense off balance. And, and I think it kind of goes to show the importance of scouting. Now, obviously, you have to execute and follow the through. The execution is the important part. Yeah. Absolutely. But you still have to have a solid plan. So the guys know exactly what they have to try to do, you know, to execute. And uh, I think with the veteran catcher they there, uh, Darno, uh, really kind of, you know, set the stage for those pitchers. I loved how Freed ended up stepping up after a couple of rough outings in the postseason and yep. really executing well, kind of showing what he was all about. Um, yeah, it, it was fun. And I, I think that's kind of like a, an inside the game look, right? The advanced scouting, nobody ever get, really gets, you know, any attention to that. But that really kind of sets the stage for these short series. In your big years in Oakland, the 89, 90, 91, who was the big scout? for the advanced guy for Tony? Uh, well, Tony was kind of the big scout. <laughs> okay. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah, we had advanced scouts, but we had, we sat down in the team meeting, you know, before a series and Tony would say his piece, Renee Latchman, the third base coach would always be talking about defensive alignment, what hitters were hot, what their tendencies were going to be. Uh, as a young player coming up with the A's, I was basically positioned out of the dugout. If I, my head wasn't in the dugout after every pitch, you know, so the scouting went, came right over onto the field. Yeah, sure, we got our advanced scouting. We knew who the hot hitters were going to be, how we were going to attack certain hitters. Um, but it was really on-field scouting, pitch by pitch. And I think that's why Tony had so much success. With Ross, the go, ahead. go ahead. Yeah, if, you uh, Mike, you know, you, you talk about, uh, I, I think, was that when you were younger that you uh, relied yeah. on? Because once you guys got older, uh, and the vet, more veteran players, scouting is important, uh, but it, again, execution. What is this pitcher doing? Where can he throw the ball? And uh, you would you would play according to, to the pitcher, what he did. What, and it could be a left-hander, a left, two left-handers are still completely different. But that's one of the things that, that you don't, I don't think you see that as much now because they rely on the cards. I'll never forget, I was in the uh, the giant clubhouse when they came to Baltimore, and I asked uh, Hensley Mullins about, do you have one of those? I'd never seen one of those cards. <laughs> and I got last night, so I, I looked at it, and I'm going, you mean to tell me these guys don't know this? <laughs> and he, he just kind of shook his head. I'm going, and then uh, Tim Kirchin was uh, was there in the, in the coach's room, and he goes, can you imagine giving this to Brooks Robinson or, or uh, Ozzy uh, um, or Cal Jr. Yeah, yeah. Cal Jr. Anybody, these big name guys, give, they would really be rude. I think some yeah. of them would, but uh, I mean, my, my point is you kind of knew at a young age, especially now it's hard to play because you don't know where the guy's going to throw the ball half the time. No. Yeah. Great point right there. I, you know, when I came up, it was pretty. Uh, it was pretty amazing the command pitchers had, right? And I remember just being like moved a step sometimes by Latchman to my right or to my left. And next thing I know, here's a line drive hit right to me. Now, you know, I mean, it could be just baseball. Could be, you know, he obviously knew what the heck he was doing. But the lo the pitchers could locate, you know, and it really helped me, you know, understand the tendencies of players. So when I after three or four years with Oakland. You know, I was kind of on my own. I mean, sure, I'd look in just in case they may have seen something different. But on the field, then I start, you could start reading hitters. You can start understanding how your pitcher's throwing. Does he have his best stuff? Playing behind Mike Mussina. There were some nights Moose didn't have his breaking ball, so he was throwing a lot of changeups. So you had to adjust, you right. know, defensively. You had to read right. that stuff. And then when you see the tendencies of the hitters, what they might be trying to do, it changes on a nightly basis. I you know, sometimes I, a pitch, I, a pitch to pitch is at times as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's kind of the beauty of the game, I think. And that's why I don't think it can be so locked up. Like you right. can play here, you play here. 
I mean, if you just you read yeah. the bat, read the bat, read the hitter, he might not have, right. he might have had a rough night, you know, too exactly. many of those red exactly. drinks the night before. Let me ask you a question. This is something that you remember Fred Stanley, chicken's a good friend of mine. Yeah. With the Yankees. And uh, anyway, we were talking and he was the, uh, heck, he was the farm director in San Francisco. He's the head of uh, uh, de uh, defense and uh, fielding and whatever. But I asked him, chicken, you, you never see the infielders, or even the outfielders, as the pitch is entering the zone, they would move. You know, take it. You don't see that now. Why is that? Other, other than the guys don't know where it's going half the time. But that's another thing. <laughs> But well, you know, there was something that, that you you see, guys. If you if you were a pitcher and you threw the ball and hit your spot, there's a good chance there's going to be somebody there to make a. Yeah. Did you mute yourself? You muted yourself, Ross. <laughs> he got so excited he muted himself. You muted yourself, Ross. <laughs> I think he might have frozen up there. So we'll get back to Ross anyway, in a second. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Ross made a great point because defensively, there's a fine line. You certainly don't want to move too soon because hitters can see that movement out in the field as well. You know, Ross so, is back with us. Ross, go ahead. You froze. Welcome back, Ross. <laughs> Am I back? Yep, yeah, you're back. Yeah. I'm, trying, I'm trying to find where the hell I'm at here. <laughs> You're you're good. You're all good. No, now. you 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 know what I was talking about, Mike. Uh, seeing the guys move, that I just you just don't see that anymore. As no, much absolutely, anymore. absolutely, and and you know, there's really a uh, an art to that because you don't want to move too soon as an infield. That's what I kind of was telling Stan there as while you were frozen in the virtual space. <laughs> never, never, um, man. <laughs> because uh, there were times I remember as a young player where sometimes coaches, especially our hitting coaches, would kind of watch how infielders are moving. And some guys, some of the hitting coaches would come up to me and say, hey, you might be tipping the pitches a little too soon. You know, if it was a breaking ball, maybe sliding over in the hole a little too soon. And you don't want to tip that off to hitters because the good hitters see that move and they can anticipate, especially if a right. shortstop, you take a step in the hole, it's probably going to be an off-speed pitch. So they can... Yeah. You know, in that brief moment, can can make an adjustment. You know, the first player I remember seeing move was Brooks at third. He always moved forward just slightly, and his thought wasn't so much he knew where it was going. He wanted to put his body in motion rather than have to react from a stop position. Mike, you you agree yeah. with that? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, uh, something that I love teaching is <clears throat> excuse me the pre-pitch now brooks movement going forward and i think everybody has like a different kind of way to get their feet going but yep. if you start from a standstill it's really hard to be as athletic as you want to be yep. so you know moving your feet kind of gets you active i always kind of liken it to if you ever watch tennis players when they have to return 120 mile an hour serve they have what's called as a split jump and their feet actually come off the ground and then they're able to react. And it's, it's like a constant movement. So it's they're always, never ever stopped and then have to go. Yeah. So their feet are off the ground and boom, they react athletically. And that's what we try to teach young kids at the baseball warehouse too, to have a solid pre-pitch. So you're actually, your feet are dang near off the ground at the point of contact so that you can move athletically. You never settle back in and then have to restart yourself. So it well, is seems, fun to try to work on that. It's all timing and rhythm, just like what the whole game is, really. And, and this is a good segue into talking about your work with the baseball warehouse. I imagine the same is true, obviously, for a hitter, that if you react, if you're just frozen, like Ross was about three minutes ago, and the pitch comes, <laughs> You've got to react. you got to pre-react to it, correct? you got to get your body in movement. Yeah, you know, there haven't been many hitters I've seen uh, hit just completely still. Only one was Paul Molitor. Molitor, was one that was the, the first guy I thought of. Yeah, players to ever defend because he had no movement. He had no tell on his swing. There was no leak on the front side. He just stood there still and then whack, just reacted to the ball. It was unbelievable. And uh, he was probably one of the greatest players ever in the game. Unfortunately, you know, too many injuries kind of, yeah. you know, but his numbers would have been, and they are unbelievable. What a player he was. 
So let me ask you the baseball warehouse. And again, if people want to look at their website, which I think is the easiest way to put you in touch with the baseball warehouse, go to the, the baseball warehouse.com is yeah. the website. Do most people come in for improvements as hitters or pitchers, or do you get people that want to improve defense base running? How about overall baseball intelligence? Yeah, absolutely. The, the whole gamut, to be honest with you. I mean, we get teams in there when we talk team situational things, but uh, typically it's it's hitting and fielding. Uh, that's kind of what I'm involved in. Uh, Matt Morris, the owner operator, does a lot of the pitching, but Scotty McGregor has given lessons over there as well. I mean, who better to learn from than Scott McGregor? Best pitch in the game, probably the changeup. Scotty McGregor had probably the best changeup in the history of game for the no a number of years, right? So, I mean, wow, what a great way to learn. But we've got awesome coaches over there. We've got, uh, obviously, some big league players. Austin Wins has come in there, Zimmerman, uh, to help with lessons. We've got some young players that have had experience at the major league level and then even in the minor leagues. So I think these fresh young faces kind of can, can relate to some of the younger players coming up, really help them out. Spencer Horowitz is a kid that graduated from St. Paul's, uh, right. went off to college, and then got drafted by the Blue Jays. He's down in Arizona Fall League right now. So... You know, those kind of kids are just fresh in the grind right now and are learning, you know, all this new age kind of stuff, uh, you know, but I still think the baseball, you still got to learn how to play the game the right way. So uh, being direct with the bat head to the ball, I think there are a lot of interesting things defensively that young players can pick up on. We've mentioned the pre-pitch, but glove position, anticipation, uh, pursuit angles. I think one of the most important things that uh, – I try to stress when I come to talk about infield is developing your internal clock. You know, uh, the average guy gets down the baseline, maybe uh, 4.5 seconds. So you better be able to make a play, a routine play every time at 4.5 seconds. And you got to learn how to train yourself, right. To do that and understand what kind of pursuit angle you're going to have to take to make these type of plays. So yeah, the baseball warehouse, you know, we've got co former college coaches, Scott Thompson, who coached at Mount St. Mary's, uh, you know, for over 20 years there, uh, is going to bring his experience. Uh, Julia uh, Collada from uh, Stevenson University coaches softball. Love watching her do her thing. You talk about some innovative training techniques. I've picked up some things defensively that she does with some of the girls in there. It's really impressive. So, um, you know, a it's couple, a great... Are a couple other local guys, Jay Witasik. I know he was with them for a yeah. while. And Kevin Cloud, two pitchers. From yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, they're involved as well. Um, every now and then we'll see them at, at some of the clinics we do. Um, but so, so many guys with professional experience, you know, have come in to help some of these kids and, and talk shop. I, I, I think kids need to hear, you know, some of the, this is how traditions get passed on and why baseball is really so great, right? You learn from experience from guys that have kind of gone through it for you, right? So we share experiences in that regard, maybe what helped us, but we also kind of share our vulnerabilities, you know, a lot of the young kids that come in there, sure, they might want to learn a great baseball swing or proper way to field the ball. But I'll tell you what, just about every kid I talk to that comes in there, they talk about the fears they have playing the game. When all of a sudden the coach is screaming on, and all of a sudden they feel the pressure from their dad or their mom, you know, or the players, you know, how do they handle themselves when they step in the batter's box? Those fears and anxieties are real. And every player, I don't care what level you're at, experiences that. The major league guys have been through it so many times that now they have a mental discipline about them. They've gone yep. through that. They have strategies that can kind of overcome, whether it be through breathing, through vis visualization, plus the thousands and thousands of repetitions they've had have kind of get, gotten them into a better place mentally kind of be able to step out of those pressure situations. Well, these kids are trying to learn that, you know? So I think it, that, that really is just another side of the game that intrigues me. I love talking to kids about that, finding ways to really settle them, them down so they can really enjoy themselves, you know? Uh, Mike, well, what do you, what do you think that's from? I, I, I know when, uh, when I was a kid, when you were a kid, 
we were able to play the games uh, without, uh, they weren't showcases. They weren't, uh, there weren't <laughs> pressure. We could play, and obviously yeah. we wanted to win, but we could play with really uh, not a lot, lot of pressure. And mm -hmm. you don't see that now. And it's, uh, I read a little, little bit about uh, what you do at the, at the warehouse and stuff. And I remember seeing that, the fear, and I'm going, you know, as a kid playing the game, it was fun. There was no fear to play in it, you know, and, and now you see that more and more. Well, what do you I, think that's, that, that's from? I just want to interject real quick. I lived in Durham, North Carolina for about three or four years, and I got to co cover Duke University and be at Mike Krzyzewski's press conferences. And it was after, I think, the, the Cubs, no, it wasn't when they won the World Series. It was when he was out there for – we're doing something at the World Series, but he talked about baseball and when the kid gets in the car after the game and how the parents, their first question is usually, how did you do? Did you win or lose? And Krzyzewski said, that's all wrong. The first question should be, did you have fun? Yeah. Go ahead, right. go ahead answering Mike's question. Well, I mean, absolutely. Ross's question. Well, e easier said than done, for sure. Yeah. I, I think there's a lot of pressure on kids. I think nowadays, especially travel teams, uh, like Ross talked about, the, the, the showcase events. And unfortunately, guys are seeing these numbers that for many will be unattainable, these spin rates, these exit velocities. <laughs> And guys are chasing these numbers that they're seeing flashed up on social media and stuff and think, well, if I don't reach that or if I don't hit a home run or something like that, I must not be that good, right? Which is just the wrong way of thinking. And so many of the young kids and even parents that I talk to, the most important thing is to have fun, right? So the youngest age, I encourage that first and foremost. Yep. If, you, if you can't have fun playing it, you know, how are you going to ever work at it to get better? Right. right? right. So you exactly. got to have a passion inside and, and you really have to find that passion. So you give encouragement um, and, and there, are, there are methods to do that the right way. Um, I think a lot of us, maybe from the old school, like my dad was in the air force, so he was a disciplinarian. And I don't know that I agreed with a lot of his tactics, <laughs> you know, both as, of my parents were in the Air Force. Oh, okay, okay. So you know all about the discipline oh, yeah. side of it too, for sure, right? So I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, in, in some areas, I think, yeah, it kind of pushes you through some things. Uh, it teaches you a little bit about being tougher, uh, a little bit of the mental toughness. But I, I think this is a new generation of kids. And I, I think, you know, they've got to kind of learn more about that kind of internal responsibility. Um to be able to kind of hold themselves accountable. And once they learn those kind of skills, then I think they'll kind of take it on and, you know, start setting goals to make themselves a little bit better and really buy in and understand that, you know, it's not necessarily about the pressure of being in the box. It's about this whole process that yep. it's going to take for you to become a good player. And, and who knows, maybe you won't be a, a really good player, but at least the steps that you're going to take will help you in life down the road anyway. Exactly. Hey, how do you... Go ahead. Oh, go, go ahead, Stan. Go, go ahead. When, when you have a player come in, do you find out that mental side of how they approach the game through the questions you ask? Because I doubt that they come in and say, Mr. Bordick, I, I really need to work on my mental approach to the game. They They probably feel that they just need to hit better or feel better or pitch better. Uh, yeah. it, it, it's an interesting aspect of instruction is asking questions and let them explain themselves to you. Yeah. Now, listen, I don't have as much coaching experience as Ross Grimsley, but I guarantee you one of the most important things of being a good coach is establishing a relationship with your players. And once you establish that kind of relationship, then they'll open up. And they'll just love to talk about yeah. things, you know, and that's kind of the beauty of what I've really enjoyed about being around these kids. You know, sure, you can talk about mechanics. You, you can do it all day if you want, but, but you got to start getting personal with them and ask them about how their day is, you know, uh, what other sports they play, just things to where they feel comfortable. And then next thing I know, oh, my gosh, when this starts dropping 
you know, that curtain starts <laughs> really. dropping, they'll open up and say, man, when I step in the box, I, I feel my knees shaking, you know, I, I just feel so tense, you know, and anxious. And then you're just like, oh my gosh, there, here we go. Now you can start talking through things. And, and really that's where the beauty of instruction comes. You know, I, I think we all are, are capable of maybe teaching a guy how to swing a bat, uh, maybe how to hold their glove, feel the ground ball. But that mental side of the game, which I think in all sports, but I think baseball is one of the toughest to be able to control your, your mental you know, stability out there to find that kind of consistency. Now you, you fail more in that than anything, any other sport, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. You know, which absolutely. is really Mike. The, the other thing I wanted to ask you is, is I know you, you deal with a lot of younger kids. How are the parents? How do the parents react? And what's what are some of the questions that they ask? And uh, the other thing, all the different uh, uh, drills and stuff you see on TV on the on the uh, the uh, YouTube or whatever. Some of the stuff is just absolutely amazing and just yeah. mind boggling. Yeah, but yeah. What, what do you, what do you, I know the parents have to, uh, uh, my little Johnny's going to be a hall of famer. He's going to play for the Yankees. What, yeah. you know, what, what do you, how do you handle that? What, uh, yeah. uh well, well, what, what do you do? I, I love, I love talking to parents, you know, whenever we have clinics or, you know, things, I love bringing the parents together and, and kind of being honest with them right up front you know, for the most part, say, listen, uh, your kids probably won't make it to the big leagues, you know, and, Good and chance. I think, yeah. but I think it's encouraging that everybody wants the best for their kids, right? So one, one of my um, most recent kind of stories, especially coming out of COVID, is to enjoy, you know, sports. I mean, for us now that we're older and now we're parents and watch our kids, you know, we have to kind of enjoy that moment right with them and, and kind of share in the passion of the game I, I think it's hard especially the kids being locked up for a year in COVID to you just can't come out and push 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 right. push because you're going to push the kids away from the game you really have to enjoy the sport with them kind of talk things through with them and you know like we alluded to earlier uh, to have fun in the game is probably the most important thing. And I think especially after coming out of this COVID, the kids kind of have to be reintroduced. Yeah, sure. They're going to put their own internal pressure on themselves. They don't need to feel that extra weight coming from the sideline, seeing their dad shake their head, you know, right. or, you know. Um, so I think giving support is, is super important. Uh, and I also think that that after a game, I, I think it's important to talk to them about the game, too. And, and not as much about, uh, oh, you should have got in front of that ball or you right. should have you should have made that play or you shouldn't have struck out in that situation. But maybe more just talk about how they're feeling, you know, after that kind of game, because I'm telling you right now, kids are harboring a lot of emotions uh, right. here over the past couple of years. And, and and a lot of it isn't good. So I think it's important for parents to kind of talk things through uh, with their kids and let the kids know that they've got somebody on their side, you know, right. backing them up. And uh, so that's kind of what I talked to the parents about a little bit. And, and I also, you know, there are a lot of, like you said, Ross, there are some that come right in and they say, well, <laughs> he's so good, man. He's like the protege <laughs> yeah. and this and that. Yeah, I know they're good. Yeah. And I appreciate that. Let's have some fun with them. You know, he's only eight years old, you know, right. <laughs> yeah. he, he's got, he's got a long way to go. Really? And of, of course, there are some other ones that I say, well, have you ever tried to trumpet? Cause I don't know if this baseball <laughs> stuff's going to work out, but yeah. uh, you know, it's about having a good time. And, and I love actually, cause a lot of parents stick around for the lessons. Yep. And when their son or their daughter does something really good, and I can see the light, not only in the kids' eyes, but the parents' eyes. Like, look at him, man. That's my boy. You know, I love that. That that is just really? so good to me. And that's why sport is so good. You know, sport in and of itself is beautiful because, you know, obviously you get to work as a team. You, you get to, to work for common goals. You get to work to better yourself as a young player. But the enjoyment of families kind of coming together and seeing those kind of successes and watching kids come up through. I mean, I know uh, there were times where I, I, I hated my dad for as hard as he was on me as a kid, but God dang it, when I 
went to high school and then college and kept playing. Man, we were best baseball buddies. Oh, yeah. You know, we love yeah. talking shop. You know, and and uh, I know he enjoyed that. And I know all parents have great hearts and want the most for their kids. Sometimes it's just a matter of kind of stepping back a little bit and let right. them be their own kind of kind of kid and let them let them play. We're talking with Mike Bordick, who is an instructor at the Baseball Warehouse. Again, that website is thebaseballwarehouse.com. Now, we talk about instruction, and we tend to think of sports camps, Mike, as being something next summer. But Baseball Warehouse has some special camp instruction and ways to do it. How does that work? Yeah, we're doing it all winter, like every weekend. My gosh, I looked at our schedule the other day. And we're bouncing around. We're going up to York, Pennsylvania, Hershey, Pennsylvania. Um, you know, so we're signing up for these camps and getting kids in there. I, I, a lot of it is just talking about, you know, things to improve on over the winter. I, I think yeah. a lot of kids don't know what to do in the off season. you know. So just kind of focusing in on their skill set a little bit. Um you know, I worry sometimes with overtraining in the game of baseball. So I think there's going to be more talk about maybe situational stuff, maybe how to take care of yourself, um, you know, on the field as far as certain drills, but especially nutritionally, that's something else that we kind of touch on too. I, I think, you know, and not to keep alluding to the COVID thing, but, you know, COVID opened up some eyes to a lot of people. You know, it's not just about going and getting a vaccine. A lot of the people that are getting affected by COVID have these comorbidities. And yeah. a lot of that can be helped with, with the way you eat. And I think nowadays yeah. kid, kids need to, to learn about proper nutrition. I, I just think there's too much junk food out there that's really... You mean, you know, you mean you hot dogs are eat? good? The hot dogs are... You know, hot, hey, I don't hey, mind a hot dog. Just that, was in between, done, that was in between double hitters. Come on, a hot dog... <laughs> Maybe that's, two. That's old school, brother. We could do that back then. We could do that back then. But and I think it's important, you know, and I'm not saying that every kid's going to make adjustments, but I think just to hear it, you know, yep. from people, to hear about some nutritional things, to make kids aware, because I don't even know that they're aware. They think that Gatorade is, is a sports drink, and unfortunately, it's loaded with sugar and, yeah. and things that they probably don't need. I, I think you know, these young kids that come in for lessons, well, if you're going to spend money on lessons, you know, I think learning about nutrition is part of being an athlete too. Sure. So before we let you go, if a parent is listening right now or a kid is listening and they want to contact, I'm suggesting they go to the website and read a little bit about the instruction, but how will they, who would they contact over there? Who will be their first point of contact to discuss bringing their kid there for instruction? at the baseball warehouse. Yeah, it would probably be Matt Morris, the owner okay. operator there. Uh, go to the baseballwarehouse.com. And uh, I know there's an email uh, on there as well. A quick story, I was up in, in Maine and uh, um, over the summer and I spoke at my old high school alma mater, Hamden Academy. And I spoke to the baseball team up there and a couple parents reached out to the baseball warehouse just for some instructional videos and stuff. And they contacted Matt Morris uh, just through email. So they actually went to the baseballwarehouse.com, got Matt's email, emailed them, and now we're going to send them a link to a bunch of videos and things like that to help with some off-season training. So yeah, it's a great site. Um, we've got, let's see, we've got, I think, uh, three locations okay. now. We've got one out in Owings Mills, Lansdowne. And, in Hartford uh, County. In Hartford, Hartford County. County. You know yeah. better than I do, yeah. Well, so, I studied it up. I didn't know about the one in Lansdowne, though. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. They've been around. Baseball Warehouse has been around for close to at least 20 years, I believe. Yeah. So, so uh, they're, doing they're some really good, good teachers. Yeah, we appreciate absolutely. your taking some time to come on, talk a little baseball and talk a little about your. And you have clearly, I think Ross and I can hear it in you. You have a passion for this. You enjoy instructing kids. Oh, I really do. Well, I enjoy yeah. every level, you know. Uh, of baseball. I think baseball is a super important sport. Obviously, I have a great passion for it. And I think there's a lot involved in the game that can really help our kids, you know, maybe not be great major league players, but be great citizens and, and help our communities. Well, we started off the conversation touching on the passing of Tom Maddie, but we're always fortunate when the Baltimore community attracts people 
like you, Mike Bordick, and we really appreciate your being on with us and our continued friendship. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. Thanks, Ross. Thanks, All buddy. Right. Appreciate again, it. for Mike yeah, Bordick and Ross Grimsley, I'm Stan the Fan Charles. Again, that email address, thebaseballwarehouse.com. And reminder, this Thursday evening, Gary Stein and I will host a remembrance of Tom Matty with Bruce Cunningham and Scott Garceau, two of his longtime broadcast partners. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you down the road just a little bit.